everybody, and welcome to the City of Bloomington. Um, this is the second in our three-part series of home improvement seminars that we sponsor every summer here at the city. Uh, this year we're focusing on some sustainability issues. Tonight we're doing uh, how to install solar panel uh, in solar panels in your home. Um, we have Dustin Dennison, I didn't remember his last name, from uh, Applied Energy Innovations. Um, and he's going to talk to you about how you can make these improvements to your home. This is a sustainable improvement that will help you save energy and reduce uh, costs to uh, uh, power your home. I'm Brian Hartman. I work with the City of Bloomington's Housing and Redevelopment, Redevelopment Authority, the HRA. We are um, a, a division that works with the city to um, do a variety of different things. We um, make rehabilitation home improvement loans. And we have some applications over there if you'd be interested in that. Um, these are loans that we make at, at very, very good terms to you to help you improve your home, roofs, siding, windows, that sort of thing. Um, they are uh, a no payment loan, which means there, you know, there's no monthly payment. They're only payable at the time of sale of your house somewhere down the road. Um, they are 4% simple interest for the first 10 years, and then doesn't accrue interest after that. So it's a good product if you're looking to do some improvements and need some financing, uh, grab a, a brochure and an application or give us a call and be happy to talk to you about that. Without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dustin. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, I'm a man of many titles and many means, but I'm going to go through uh, tonight kind of the ABCs of what solar is, uh, how it affects us as a community, what you can do to implement renewable energy on your property. Um, I'm a principal of Applied Energy Innovations. Uh, also, we just recently in the last three, uh, two months uh, started a subsidiary company called MN Community Solar, which is the first ever community solar model um, in Minnesota. I will go into what community solar is and how that can also benefit you. I am also a board member of MRES, which is the Minnesota Renewable Energy Society. Are there any MRES members or anyone have, has heard of MRES before? Show of hands. MRES has been around for about 30 years and I'll um, go into that slide presentation uh, in a couple minutes here. I'm also a board member, uh, founding member of Mencia, which is the Minnesota Solar Energy Industry Association, which is for the first time ever, the lobbying arm at the Capitol uh, to help push through and help promote good solar policy in the state of Minnesota. So um, I'm very active, very engaged in the solar community. Um, applied Energy Innovations, uh, we've been around for three years uh, doing both commercial and residential installations uh, using a variety of um, financial means, uh, working with different cities, uh, working with PACE, Property Assessed Clean Energy Financing for commercial buildings, uh, CEE currently also has a program for financing for residential installations. And we also like to work with Minnesota made products. Many of you might be aware of 10K Solar located here in Bloomington. Has anybody heard of that product? Heard of them before? Very good. So we actually, in the state of Minnesota, manufacture five different solar products that are installed. That's a combination of solar thermal, solar hot air, solar hydronic and two solar PV manufacturers. So solar PV is solar electric panels and those are the 10K solar in Bloomington for both commercial and residential installations and the silicon energy modules which are made up in Mount Iron in northern Minnesota. So what a lot of people don't know is in Minnesota we have a manufacturing stream of over 300 manufacturers parts, pieces, and components that go into not only the products and systems that are installed here in Minnesota, but also globally. Uh, so we have a good base here in Minnesota manufacturing and supporting solar. Um, one thing before I jump into the slideshow that I really want to announce that's happened that's very significant to everyone in Minnesota is uh, for the last three years, uh, I was on a coalition called the Minnesota Works, Minnesota Solar Works Coalition. And what we were was we were the three-year architect 
of several bills, actually seven bills that got entered into the legislation this year. And if we look at Minnesota, our letter grade compared to other states in terms of our solar policy, we had about a D minus. So what we did this le legislative cycle was we moved our grade from a D minus in terms of solar policies and implementation up to about a solid A. And that has really put Minnesota on the map in the last month in terms of bringing more manufacturers into the state, supporting local economic development, local products, and local financing for systems. So um, the beginning of the legislative cycle, we entered seven bills into the Capitol. And these seven bills covered everything from what was called a, a VOS, a value of solar, to community solar, to um, changes in net metering, which is a cap currently in place for commercial installations, to changes to the PACE law, to um, uh, there's about two or three other components of this bill. And they got rolled into an omnibus bill. So for essentially a month and a half at the Capitol, we lobbied and about 70 organizations came together. Manufacturing, we had labor, we had environment, we had business, and we had nonprofits. It was a huge coalition we brought to the Capitol this year and championed a good solar policy bill that is gonna grow the market share here in Minnesota. Now to put that into perspective where we're at right now, in the last 10 years, we have installed 13 megawatts worth of solar. Okay, a, a megawatt is approximately, we could say maybe about 150 to, to 200 households worth of power. So we have 13 megawatts of power installed. And if we were to put that in a pie chart of all of our energy produced in Minnesota, it would be just a very, very, very small sliver. So 13 megawatts, what we have currently, the new law, the solar energy standard, the SES, will now move that production from 13 megawatts of installed to 500 megawatts in the next six years. That is a huge, huge jump. That means that we as a installer community and a developer community need to have a ramp up schedule. It's approximately 60 megawatts a year. So we're talking about an industry that's been on the ground floor for the last three to five years to now moving to an exponential amount of installations, an exponential amount of manufacturing that's taking place to meet some of our solar energy standards. So that's great news. It's good news for everybody. And I'm proud to say what, what we're really focusing on at AEI and MN Community Solar, and even the organizations such as MRES and Mencia, is really about good economic development. It's putting people to work in local jobs, taking those products, putting them out, into the marketplace where they can produce good, clean energy that's, that's free of carbon production. And we can, we can also take local Minnesota dollars as investment and put those private dollars into installations. And really, it's a win-win for the utility. It's a win-win for the customer. We're seeing prices that are coming down exponentially uh, in the last three years. Um, so, we passed a bill. It's a huge bill. It's good news to everybody in the state. And what's nice is it has a large component that really does bring in uh, private investment dollars. And uh, the community solar, I'll talk a little bit more later, is going to be a huge uh, opportunity for people to get involved in solar at a fraction of the cost of actually installing on your property. We've identified that 75% of the households out there either don't have a good roof, they have shading, their roof is in the wrong orientation. But what a community solar does now is it allows people to invest in a subscription of energy at an off-site location. So say maybe you have a facility, a building like this, that's a city hall, or maybe you have a warehouse district where you have large roof space. What community solar allows, is it allows us to have a 25-year roof lease with that property owner. It'll generate revenue from the subscribers in the array that's on that roof. And in that installation, when we bring investors, private dollars in to take advantage of the tax credits, to take advantage of the equipment depreciation, which a lot of us as, as homeowners can't do, that equipment depreciation and that 30% ITC 
is very attractive to investors and they will bring their dollars into these projects and we will see one megawatt size projects driven down to three dollars a watt or less. Now the average market price out there for installation of solar on your property is going to probably be between anywhere from four fifty a watt up to six dollars to seven dollars per watt. So when we look at that four to six dollars a watt range now in a community solar example we can drive that cost below three dollars we're really talking about making this economical and accessible to everybody whether you live in an apartment whether you live in a condo whether you don't have the right roof structure or you have too much shading it's an opportunity for people to buy in and really the big picture here is whether you're doing it for your own property you're having a solar install done on your roof or you're participating in community solar you're essentially locking in your cost of energy for the next 25 years. So, how is that a value? Well, think about this. Excel Energy recently asked for a ratepayer increase, 8.5% in one year. 8.5% ratepayer increase. Now, we know nationally at a historic average, utility costs are increasing at 3% per year. Add 3% over 25 years. Your cost of electricity is growing. When you invest in a renewable energy system for your property, what you're doing is you're buying your electricity up front. You're taking that, your investment, you're buying product, you're putting it on a roof, and you now have a renewable energy source for the next 25 years that's going to power your property. What's unique about that, why the magic number is 25 years, is because the products we use, whether they're Minnesota-made modules or they're Chinese-made modules, they all have production warranties and production guarantees. We're talking about a product and a science now that is engineered, and we know it's going to deliver based on, in Minnesota, 4.6 hours average per day throughout the year we know it's going to have a, a production uh, that will put out each and every day of every year, of every month, for the next 25 years. So think about that concept. It's lock, the ability to lock in your power for the next 25 years. And, and a lot of homeowners have been able to get creative with their financing and realize that in the state of Minnesota, we have a couple of unique laws that were passed in 2010. First of all, there's no sales tax on a renewable energy system. So as an incentive, when you purchase a solar system, there's no sales tax on that. The second unique thing is, when you invest in a renewable energy system on your property, whether it's a business or a residence, the city, the county, or municipality cannot come back and reassess your property value based on the value of that installation. So if I were to add a $40,000 installation, uh, $40,000 $40, addition, to my house, to my property. Uh, maybe I'm putting in um, uh, you know, a new addition onto the back of my house, a new kitchen. Maybe I'm putting on a deck, building a garage. Well, the city can come back and they can reassess your property value based on that. When you do a renewable energy system, we've put into law that the city or county anywhere in the state of Minnesota cannot come back and reassess your property value based on that installation. So there's a lot of unique things that are happening around solar to really make this accessible, make it affordable, and make it take away some of the soft costs for the city, even when we do the installations, when we pull our permitting and we go through zoning and ordinance, to really make this easy for everybody. Any questions on, on any of that? Yes? Is there a limit to the, that tax? You said you can't tax it based on an addition? Mm -hmm. Is there a limit on the number of years that it won't be raised for value? Or is that Un until someone were to change the law, right now the way the law is written, and I believe it's going to stay in there for a long, long time, uh, your property cannot be reassessed based on the value of that installation. I have a question for you guys. Does anybody know how many coal fields Minnesota has that we get our coal from for energy? Zero. Minnesota has no coal fields. 100% of our coal comes out of North Dakota. That means we extract it, we extract it, we ship it, we put it on a train, we send it to a steam generation, we have generation loss that occurs, we have line loss transmission that occurs, 
because most of our coal plants are about 200 to 300 miles away from the city. We're producing carbon. We're doing all these things to get power into Minnesota. Does anybody know how many oil fields Minnesota has? Zero. So Minnesota has zero coal. Minnesota has zero oil. Does anybody know how many um, gas fields Minnesota has? Zero. zero. So now think about this. We as a state spend $20 billion a year to bring raw resources into this state to produce energy. We don't have natural gas. We don't have oil. We don't have coal. The oil and gas all comes from pipelines out of Canada. So think about it. That's a pretty big amount. $20 billion a year. You and I spend, it's an average of $4,000 per Minnesotan to bring raw resources into this state to make electricity. We have a structure. We work with what's called monopolies, or they're called utilities. And we have relationships with them where they have set up a structure where we are bringing those raw resources and they are transforming those into electrical generation. What we've said at the Capitol, when we went back, MRES and Mencia, and we said was, if we spend that much exporting our dollars out of the state, why can't we spend a portion of that to create clean energy here, to create green jobs, and to hire people and invest back into our own energy infrastructure? I think that's a good argument. I think that's a safe argument. And I think it's being done with wind. I know it's being done with wind. And with this new bill, it's going to give a kickstart to solar. So I'm excited to talk about that. And I just wanted to put that into perspective uh, for you. $20 billion a year we're spending to bring raw resources into the state to make electricity. When we have one of the best resources up in the sky that's bringing us energy every single day, we just have to harness it. So MRES is an organization that's been around for 30 years. Um, our mission is to advance a sustainable society and renewable energy economy through education, leadership, and example. MRES is a nonprofit organization. Um, our vision to be a key catalyst in advancing solar energy and transforming Minnesota energy landscape to embrace efficiency and sustainability. MRES does a lot of functions, and I'm going to use parts of this slideshow. Uh, to kind of get people up to speed and how we can implement solar on our, on our own homes. But let's go through briefly a little bit about renewable energy. Uh, MRES is involved in education, awareness, and advocacy efforts for all forms of renewable energy with a particular emphasis on solar technology. What are renewable energies? Solar electric, solar thermal, wind energy, wave energy, tidal energy, geothermal, biomass, and hydro. Now in Minnesota, Obviously, we don't have that whole list. So there's a few things we are working with. Um, why use solar energy? The fuel is free where sun shines. It's distributed energy, lower transmission costs. Does anybody know what that means, distributed energy? It means you can produce power at your house or at your property or at your business at peak demand. Now that's a very important word to the utility companies because utility companies are mandated to make sure that they can supply power at peak demand when it's needed. And one of the big steps utility companies have done is to ensure that they have that extra demand capacity in place. A, a big example of this is the transformation of some of the coal plants, the Northeast NSP plant, the Highbridge plant in St. Paul, is to convert these to peaking plants. So these are gas-fired peaking plants that might not necessarily run 365 days a year. They might run 30 days a year. They might run even less. They are there specifically not as base load. They're there to make sure that on a day like this, when the air conditioning's running, everyone has their AC, they want to be comfortable, that they can take care of load demand that we're seeing taking place right now. Um, Again, solar energy and save, it's abundant and sustainable. It aligns with the summer load. It's indigenous to Minnesota. We don't need to import solar energy. It comes to us free every day. Uh, solar PV costs are falling. It's quickly deployed. It's easily scalable. It help, 
help meet increasing world energy demand. It's affordable and it's clean. Solar energy is abundant. I'm going to go through some of these sides, slides pretty quickly because I want to, what I want to get to is the different technologies that are available between solar thermal, solar hot air, and solar PV and how these can all play a role in your decision about what you want to implement on your, your, uh, your property. Uh, obviously, solar radiation, is, if we look at this as a um, renewable energy source compared to wind, biomass, geothermal, wa water, we have a whole lot of solar radiation that takes place every single day. Our motto is a solar spill is a good day. Solar energy is sustainable. We know that solar is going to be around for a long time. Solar electric and summer load. How do we balance between peak, peak summer load and when the demand is? Again, in Minnesota, as I explained, we have a 4.6 hour average solar window each day. Minnesota's energy resources, um, a lot of people don't know this. We have a solar window, a resource, similar to Houston, Texas, and similar to Tallahassee, Florida. In terms of the state of Minnesota, wind, we are fourth in U.S. generation. We're sixth in U.S. resource. Biomass, we're first in biofuel production. And fossil fuels, as I said before, we have no natural gas, no oil, no coal. Fossil fuel costs $20 billion a year imported into Minnesota. Um, so we have a great solar window here in Minnesota. This is a good, safe, sound investment that's not going away. We look at the solar resource compared. Germany has the most deployed and installed solar of any other country right now. I think actually Spain is catching up with them pretty quick. This graph shows us the, uh, the actual solar resource, the amount of sunlight intensity that comes down. In Minnesota, we have a better solar resource than Germany. We have a better solar resource than Alaska. We have a very comparable solar resource, you can see, compared to the south even. What's unique about Minnesota and why it's a good climate for solar is that solar PV panels, solar electric panels, produce more energy when it's cooler outside. They are more efficient. As the temperature drops, the temperature gets colder. When we design systems, we have to design systems so that they can take on the increased capacity in extreme cold weather when the sun is out. So it's unique to Minnesota. It's unique because the panels perform less when they're 120 degrees, when they're 110 degrees up on that roof. Uh, you know, again, some of our biomass resources, um, our U.S. wind resources, many of you are aware the western part of the state is a great resource for wind. Uh, oil and gas, we don't have a single um, fracking permit pulled in the state of Minnesota. Uh, in terms of oil, we don't have any oil. It all comes from Canada. Uh, our coal resources, you can see, comes from North Dakota. And the other part was hydro. We do get a good portion of our hydro that comes out of, hydropower comes out of Canada also. Uh, this just kind of really right now depicts the growth of the industry, um, how it's growing, how fast it's growing. Um, solar was growing last year, I believe the numbers for worldwide growth were 176% growth over the year prior. So we're in a marketplace that this is just continuing to evolve and continuing to grow, and it's growing exponentially. Solar, fo solar photovoltaic module costs are dropping. Uh, we can see the costs here are dropping. We used to install systems, well, three years ago we were installing at about $7 per watt. Now we're installing systems at about $4.50 per watt. And with community solar, you'll see systems that are built because of um, the size of scale, systems that will be built and installed for less than $3 per watt. So we really start to see those costs drop. Uh, grid parity, uh, we're getting there. Grid parity is basically the same cost that you've spent over 25 years to invest in electricity as the same exact cost that you would spend over 25 years just to keep buying your energy from utility company. Uh, 
let's go into some of the different technologies. We talked about the, the uh, pie of renewable energy, the nation's energy supply. Renewable energy is only 8%. Biomass is 50, hydropower 35. Solar, just a sliver, is 1%. Uh, this table is from 2009. Um, I got to tell you right now, probably 2013, that that solar is probably, I would say, up in the, up in the higher single digits, 8 or 9%. And the reason being is it's about public policy. And it's about having renewable energy standards, the RES. Minnesota has a 25% renewable energy standard, which means the utilities are mandated and all the energy they produce, 25% of it must be from renewable energy sources. The growth of world energy demand, we know that uh, energy continues to grow. Where we get our power, we talked about where our power comes from. How clean is our energy? When we look at the combustion process involved in coal, gas, or oil, we're putting things out into the environment. Carbon dioxide, nitrogen, sulfur, particulate matter, mercury, all of these things are coming out of our, our coal plants. The effects of air pollution, uh, we see record numbers of asthma. Uh, we know that people are sensitive to some of the, the pollutants that are coming out. Air pollution from solar power, zero. That's one of the nice things that was passed in this bill called VOS. I mentioned this, value of solar. What we did for one of the first times in the nation was we went to our legislators at the Capitol this year and we pleaded the case and said that those that produce energy by solar should have a higher value to that energy than electricity produced by coal. And as I explained, if you think about it, when you look at all the inputs that go into producing electricity by coal, you've got, again, the extraction out of the ground, you've got transportation to steam generation, you've got carbon production, you've got all these inputs that take place. You've also got uh, transmission line loss and you have to have a base load and you have to have peaking capacity behind coal produced energy. What we're saying is there should be a VOS created, a value of solar that says if we can produce, if you can own and produce your electricity that produces at peak demand is centrally distributed which means you can take your power whatever you're not feeding into your own property and you can dump it into the grid into the community around you and that power you produce does not produce carbon. You can do all these things and the value of that should be higher than that produced by coal. So we know right now um, as Excel Energy customers the value right now of coal is approximately nine cents a watt. So nine cents a watt if you break down your utility bill that's what we're all paying. And we've done is we've successfully gone to the legislature and said if you have a renewable energy system you should have an incentive. It's almost like a fit, a feed-in tariff. And that incentive, it's a performance-based incentive, is going to allow for your installation on your property to pay itself off even faster. We talk about renewables and energy efficiency. We always like to kind of think of this as the food pyramid. Before you jump into solar, think about your home, think about your property, the installation. You know, do, do the low-hanging fruit, the items down here. Make sure that you're shutting off the devices in your house. Make sure you're shutting off the lights. Make sure you don't have fans that are running unintended. Make sure you're looking at your lighting. Do a simple lighting retrofit in your house. I, I'm just amazed at the cost of LEDs as they continue to drop uh, in the big box stores. Uh, it used to be CFLs were the big thing. Now LEDs are, are just amazing with what they're doing. Um, we do, our company does uh, commercial lighting retrofits. We went into a condominium complex that had nine buildings. And uh, we did a complete conversion on, I think it was 136 light fixtures. And we dropped their energy cost and their parking lots and their exterior lighting by 75%. We were replacing 150 watt high pressure sodium fixtures with 20 watt fixtures. So the savings were amazing. They had an ROI return on investment that was four years for what they were saving. 
So as we work our way up, up, you know, insulation, attics, walls, foundations, crawl spaces, water heating, heating and cooling, at the top we have our, our renewables. A time to think of getting the renewables is after you've made a decision to tackle some of these other items. Solar technology 3,000 years ago. These guys had it right. Passive sun. Passive solar heating. So what we're going to get into is the technologies and how these affect your, your property. Um, passive solar heating, simply the orientation, the direction that your house is facing and the shape and size of your eaves. What are they doing? In the summer, think about that sun. It's directly over your house. You know, you've got a, um, an awning that comes out to help shade that property. You're taking advantage in the, su in the winter when the sun is at a much lower apex in the sky. You've got direct light that's coming in. Taking advantage of that passive technology. Uh, we have solar hydronic collectors. Um, solar hydronic collectors, we're talking specifically about a system that has a glycol that runs through the panels on your roof and then runs back to do either your domestic hot water or can do your domestic heating. Two different types of technology, the evacuated tubes and the flat panels. We have a manufacturer in Minnesota here, Solar Skies made in Alexandria, Minnesota that manufactures flat plate solar thermal panels. Uh, we've installed many of these throughout the metro on both residents and businesses and they are amazing for what they can do. We get into evacuated tubes, we can get into temperatures that are up into the 300 degree, above boiling. It's pretty amazing what can be done. In fact, these systems get so hot and they're about twice the cost, but they get so hot right now that in the summer we have to figure out a way to actually get the heat off these systems. We typically will pump this into a radiator. Um, outside the house or in a garage in a, on a, in a space that's not usually lived in and we can run a fan just to get that heat off of there. If we keep the glycol in the system, if we don't circulate it, we can actually fracture the glycol, which is we're actually separating the, the water out of the chemical formula. So these systems are very effective and what's nice, make a note, in 2014 there will be a rebate, an incentive for solar thermal installations. We do a lot of two panel solar thermal installations that would take care of domestic hot water. We have a solar thermal tank that typically goes in the basement of your house that has a heat exchanger in it. We're taking that hot glycol and the systems that we install. I've had days in the winter in January where our systems are producing about 160 degree hot water in single degree temperature in the middle of winter. Um, these are amazing systems for what they're doing. Any questions on solar thermal? Yep. You said in 2014 there will be a rebate. Is that just is that a Minnesota rebate? That is correct. It's for Minnesota-made products for um, for the solar skies. Yes. You said two panels for the hot water heater. That's pretty typical. Yep. And so, how, so how does the how does the uh, how does it work more specifically than that than what you just said? So here's here's the basics of it. You've got two panels up on your roof. You have a pump station, a small pump station mounted on the wall, and then you have a solar thermal tank. And in that solar thermal tank is a heat exchanger, basically a coil. And what your pump station is doing is your pump station is circulating glycol from the roof. And we use glycol because in the winter, we don't want that system to freeze up. So we're taking that glycol from the roof, we're running it through a line set, a supply and return piping system from the roof, usually down through the house or on the exterior of the house. We then take it in through the pump station, down to the heat exchanger. That heat exchanger is then taking that BTU load from that glycol, from that heat exchanger, and transferring it in the tank into your domestic hot water. And typically what we do is we have to always install a thermostatic mixing valve because in the summer we can get those tank temperatures up to 200 degrees or more. Can be very very hot systems. So is the pump actually running on electricity then? Pump's running on a minimal amount of electricity. Yeah. Yep, yep, minimal amount. I think it's maybe anywhere depending on the pump size, three to seven watts. So it's just circulating that water, and uh, once you get the water moving because of the rise and fall effect, it, it, it moves pretty pretty easy. Is this how the uh, like down in Florida that they're doing the heating their pools? Oh, absolutely. Yep. 
a lot of, a lot of heating, uh, pool heating being done. Um, you know, that same application, they use what's called the, like the plastic mats. And the plastic mats they'll put up on the roof or they'll put out in the yard. And uh, just exposure to sun, um, you can actually really end up overheating your pool in the summertime. Uh, but in Minnesota, what it does is it extends your swim period for about an additional two months before and after your typical um, uh, swimming season. Any other questions on solar thermal? Did you say you have to have a basement? No, you don't have to have a basement. Okay. You've got probably a mechanical room where your furnace or your boiler is and your wa hot water heater is right now. And then what we do also is we have a couple different applications in that solar thermal. Um, we can use the existing water tank you have, um, if, but we have to install the new solar thermal tank because it has a heat exchanger in it. Uh, when we do that, when we use your existing tank, what we're doing is we're basically expanding the capacity and now you've got two tanks of hot water available to you. We always have a backup. By code, by state law, we have a heating element inside that solar thermal tank or we have a um, gas-fired combustion burner in that tank. So worst case scenario, say the sun was covered up for 14 days, two weeks or three weeks in the winter and you weren't getting any heat production out of your solar thermal system, you've always got a backup there. So that's, that's by code. Um, again, solar heating in Minnesota, solar water heating. This is actually on the, I believe this is the Kalahari Resort in Wisconsin Dells. And they installed this system to take care of their laundry needs. They found out this system was producing so much BTU, so much heat, that they piped in a secondary supply line off this system and started heating their pools with it. So very efficient, very effective system. Again, this application was Kalahari uh, Resort and um, Solar Skies product. We have our reel. This is made in Pine River, Minnesota. So this is a solar hot air product. What this product does on the back of this, back of this panel, it has an inlet and it has an outlet. And what happens is that inlet's taking cool air from the building it's circulating it between the glazing and the, heat, and the, and the uh, heat exchanger, which is a flat plate, collector surface, and it's heating that air. And slowly that air is going through this system and it's being brought back into the building through the top. So that's an example of a solar hot, hot air system. I think we've got a couple more pictures of that. So that's another technology to think about. When this is deployed on your property, this does not go on your roof. So solar hot air is going to be mounted on a south-facing wall. Typically, it's a two-panel system that can be installed. It pretty much looks like if you were to have um, uh, a set of um, uh, French doors or a double door uh, exterior deck door on your house that had dark glazing, that's what this is going to look like. Solar PV technology today, think about this, we're flying planes just off the energy of the sun. It's pretty amazing the advancement that solar is, is, is taking. Solar electronic technology, we have all different types of technology and I'm not gonna get too deep into them. There's monocrystalline modules, there's poly modules, there's thin film technology. Um, what I am gonna suggest and I'm gonna stay away from is some of the older technologies, the thin film technology. Um, this is basically the amorphous flexible film that usually gets put on a structure, uh, say a standing seam sheet metal roof. Actually, the Science Museum in Minnesota, uh, next time you're down the bottom of the Science Museum, they have a uh, outdoor backyard play area. That whole roof on that outdoor backyard play area has the amorphous um, thin film um, solar on it. Uh, it's a little bit cheaper than traditional modules. Uh, but it has also a lot less uh, longer life expectancy. Solar PV technology, here's a great example. Uh, I talked about the 25-year um, the production guarantees um, and the warranties that are out there. We've got solar up on satellites that have been up there since the 70s, and they're still producing power. And I got to believe that the elements are a little bit more harsh out here than they are down here. So that's really truly a statement. We don't know how far some of our technologies in terms of production will get, 
The silicon energy module I talked about, the one that's produced, anybody remember where that one's produced? Up north, Iron Mountain. That particular product itself has been tested by several independent testing organizations and they expect a hundred year life on that module for production. There's going to be a D rate factor, what's called a degradation factor, that plays into all components. Anything you put into the sun for 20 years is going to eventually degrade. That also plays out in solar systems. But when we talk about the silicon energy module, they have a system that's been tested rated up to 100 years. And what they do is they take that module, they put it in a testing facility, they freeze it, they thaw it, they cover it with water, they do this over and over and over and they flash test it and they simulate 100 years worth of elements on their modules. So we know the technology is good, we know it's going to last. Um, I just talked, I just mentioned the silicon energy module. Here's a great segue. Solar no longer has to always be on your roof. We are doing applications now. We've got a nice little A-frame structure. Actually, it's a, a side mount structure off the house. These are getting more and more common to people that don't have a good roof or an accessible roof for solar. We also have a lot of freestanding structures we can put in the yard. We can do gazebos. We can cover carports. Um, we can cover, uh, we can do pergolas. We can do a lot of things now with solar. And you know, you don't have to think about this specifically being attached to your roof. There's a lot of applications. Uh, residential roof mount with silicon energy. There's another example. Uh, solar electric made in Minnesota. I'm getting close to the end here. We're getting a little long. Uh, the roof mount system, this is 10K solar. These modules are made here in Bloomington, I believe off of 94th and about Penn. Uh, ground mount system for agriculture. We're starting to see these systems used in all sorts of business and industry. Here's an important one to think about. Your property on your installation for your, your home or business. What is the solar resource? What does that look like for that site? So my recommendation, when you decide to take the steps and you want to look at solar on your own property, is to think about what your solar resource is. We use, in our industry, we use what's called a pathfinder. And that pathfinder is a scientific device that has a fisheye lens on it that gives us a refractive look around your property. And what it does is it shows us any obstructions or any trees or any growth that might inhibit the production of solar energy on your property. So with this lens, we can see with that reflective bubble, you see all these little shapes and shades. And you've got trees, you've got a big tree right here. What this device does is we take a picture of this, we bring it back to our office, we put it into our software. What we then do is we take our software and each of these radius lines here corresponds to a month of the year. And each of these numbers corresponds to a day during that month. So in the middle here we would have noon and we would have our certain months drawn out and then we would trace out where that shading occurs. And as we trace out around this big tree that's here, we trace out around that tree, we plug this into our software and what it does is it gives us an engineered number that we can then compare that number to any types of the technology that we want to install. Whether it's solar thermal or solar PV, we can then come back to you and we can tell you exactly, Mr. or Mrs. Johnson, this is what your system's going to produce on a yearly average basis. It's pretty neat and I have to say uh, we have a great, our company AEI, we have a great slideshow presentation where we go out and we show all the systems, the pathfinders, the reports that we do. And then we come back and we show our customers after a year, we graph it out and we say, well, the blue line on the graph represents what we told you it would produce. And then the green line is actually above everything we told you it would produce. So we're very conservative in our estimates and good contractors, good installers out there, there's plenty of them out there, are going to walk you through the process of a solar site assessment. But that is the first thing you need to consider, the first thing you need to have done on your property is have a solar site assessment done. Um, contractors are going to uh, 
typical cost for a site assessment might be anywhere from zero a complimentary site assessment to uh, $250. Um, depending on the price that you pay is what you're going to get delivered. Um, our company, we do a $250 site assessment, but we also deliver a full, about a nine page report and we do a preliminary design. So you see a conceptual drawing of what it's gonna look like on your house and what it's gonna produce. Um, MRES, Minnesota Renewable Energy Society, also does solar site assessments. They do a reduced solar site assessment. I believe it's about $175. Um, and they serve a lot of the metro area. And uh, as a member, I believe you also uh, get a discount. I think it's a $25 coupon uh, you'd have ac accessible. So understanding your solar resource is important because the tree that might be 100 feet away from your house that you don't think is going to have any shading issues in all reality, most people, most homeowners, when we get out there and we set up the Pathfinder, we identify that when the summer or when the winter um, solstice when that sun is at 18 degrees, it's actually taking every object and every tree around your property and it's casting a 100 to 200 foot shadow across your property. So that's really something to think about. Now, most of the incentives and rebates up to 2014 from utility company from the state have all been driven on, you have to have a shade free window of 85% to 90% or better in order to get the rebates. So if you've got a property and your shading comes in at 80% or 70%, um, you're not going to have a system that's going to have value to you because you're just not going to produce the numbers you need. I can tell you this. Most systems we install, uh, the utility company allows us to install a renewable energy system up to 120% of your consumption. So that means what you consume, we can get you net neutral and 20% above and beyond, we can get you in a position where you actually get a check back from the utility company. Now, about 80% of the systems we install, we get most of our customers up to that 120% category. And that's pretty neat because that means they're actually getting cash positive return back on their system. A um, lot of people ask, a lot of people talk about, well, what's the ROI? What's my return on investment? I like to push back sometimes and ask the question, well, what's the return on investment on your snowmobile? What's your ROI on your fishing boat? Any of that have an ROI? Maybe you do a $30,000 or $40,000 addition to your house. Well, what's your return on investment there? You're getting charged a property tax increase. And the difference is this system, once it pays itself off, will actually make you money for the rest of the life of its system. That's something no other investment typically can make. Um, average cost for systems. So here we are moving into 2014. We've had in the state of Minnesota, we've had a series of incredible rebates, incredible incentives. You guys have heard this. People have had systems installed out of pocket for $4,000 or $5,000. It's pretty amazing. How did they do this? They got their projects in the queue with their contractor and with the utility company. These are very, very competitive rebate cycles. I want to give you an example. Um, Excel Energy had its first rebate cycle. It was a triennium funded rebate and it ran from 2010 to 2013. At the end of 2013, Excel Energy said, we're going to cut this program. It's been fully subscribed. We had some great success, but it's time to move on. There was enough public outcry and enough public pressure that went back to the DER, D Division of Energy Resources and the PUC, that said, no, this is a growing market. It needs to continue to grow and have that ability to get up off its feet. So through public pressure and public demand, Excel Energy came back and funded this program for the next triennium. So what they've done is they put $5 million of money in for Minnesota-made products and $5 million for the Solar Rewards Program. The new program opened up in March of this year. That new program on the first day had 444 applications just for Excel area here. Within one week, they had over 800 applications. So this program got fully subscribed. This program was oversubscribed day one, and that's exactly what I predicted 
And exactly what I told our clients was that this program is so popular, the incentives are so good that you know, we'll get your project into the queue, but we can't make a guarantee it'll get funded, the rebate will get funded this year. Most likely, Excel is going to go through its projects this year and it's, it's releasing these acknowledgement letters, which is your, your verification that you're getting a rebate. It's releasing these acknowledgement letters and a lot of our customers are going to end up rolling over into next year until the project gets installed so that they know they've got their rebate coming. What changed in the new legislation was this. The new legislation now says instead of just giving individuals rebate money upon installation of the project, because remember you've got a couple different incentives here. You've got a 30% federal tax credit. So 30% that you can roll over for up to five years. So let's say my installation that I'm getting, I'm spending $30,000 and 30% 30 of that is a tax credit. So $10,000 of that tax credit I get to use against my future tax liability for up to five years. So let's say next year I, I pull out retirement funds and I get my tax hit or I pull out an IRA or um, maybe my next year I don't have a big tax liability. Maybe I need to go back and restructure something with my, my accountant. I have up to five years to consume that tax liability with that tax credit. So that's how that works. Now the 30% tax credit will be there until 2016. So we have about another three years of this tax credit that's out there. We don't know if it's going to get extended three years out. It's a ways away. The other incentive out there, again, is the utility company, Excel Energy. Now, what's changed in 2013 is they have said, instead of doling out the rebates, they are going to have a performance-based incentive. So what that is, is it's a performance-based incentive that says the installations that occur that have good production, good sun, minimal shading, will have a faster payback, a faster return on investment due to the production that they're making. And I believe that that, that pool of money, well actually I know, it's funded to $15 million a year for the next 10 years at performance-based incentive. And on top of that, there's another $5 million a year that Excel Energy is throwing in. So we have some very powerful rebates out there. Really what the trick is, is talking to an installer, talking to a contractor or developer and figuring out how you get yourself into that queue. Getting your $250 application filled out with Excel Energy and then basically it could be just a waiting game. Is it going to get done this year based on demand? It could get done next year based on demand. So the other part in closing this out about integrating solar into your properties is to think about the infrastructure of your house. Uh, about 95% of all installations we do, uh, we don't have to do any form of remedial structural work. Uh, as long as it's a conforming um, solar system, uh, which means um, it's, a, it's a system that's installed that's not pitched off the roof, uh, we don't need to bring in any structural engineers. We don't bring in, need to do any modification to the roof. Uh, so a conforming solar system, a PV or a flat plate collector that's not pitched off the roof, um, we can get installed and uh, we don't have to have any excess cost in there. We can typically get that through permitting and zoning with the city in one day, out one day with the permit. That's very nice, very easy. Uh, in terms of if you're looking at solar PV, your electrical panel. A lot of people ask about getting this into the electrical system. Most systems that are 3.8 kW, which is 3,800 watts, are going to consume a electrical panel that's a 100 amp service. If you've got a bigger system, if the consumption you're using, and we're going to take a look at your electrical bills, and we're going to look at exactly what you're consuming month after month, year after year, and we're going to identify how close can we get to, to taking care of that load. And if you have enough roof space, we'll do that 20% above and beyond. But really, what we're looking at, when we get above 3.8 kW, we really need a, a home electrical panel that has a 200 amp service. That allows us what we need by NEC code to put power into your electrical panel. 
Yes. So, okay, when you say, is this a separate panel? Say, like, we have a 200 amp panel right now. Yep. You have, you have to buy a separate one, or nope. did it be fed into your existing panel? As long as I've got two open breaker sp spots, two open breaker spots in that panel, we can go ahead and we can use your existing panel. And what we're going to do is we're going to put in a series of disconnect switches on the outside of the house, the small boxes. We're going to have a production meter. We're going to establish, we're going to mount the, uh, um, the, the production box. Utility company is going to come out. They're going to install their production meter in there. And they're going to tell exactly what your consumption and what your production is. We also install monitoring systems with all of our installations. And our basic package, what most people do, is tell you what your system is producing. Um, I can look up right now on my phone any number of, you know, 42 or 57 systems and I can look at exactly what these systems for each individual property is generating. Um, I can do that because I'm an admin, but you yourself on your own property, anywhere you have an internet connection, you can actually look at what your system's producing. We also have the software and the capacity and the technology to do your consumption too. So you can look at a daily and monthly basis. Uh, I can look at some of our customers and I can tell at 7.05 in the morning, oh, the, air, the, uh, the blow dryer just went on. Or I can tell exactly at uh, 6 o'clock at night that someone's firing up their electric range or their electric stove. You can see those spikes right in the day. They're very clear. You can see how much power is being consumed. We can actually we can monitor systems where uh, random or irregular patterns that occur. We can tell if there's problems. Uh, we had one person had a sump pump that just started running and it never shut off. And we were able to identify what is that electrical load coming from? It's coming from that sump pump. So again, talking about integrating this on your property, um, you know, number one, this is something you really don't want to do by yourself. You need to hire a contractor. You need to hire somebody that's going to design the system. You need to hire somebody that's going to pull the permits and do the installation right. And the reason for that is this. We're talking about producing DC voltage. Now, the thing with DC voltage is when I have my electrical panel, and I'm walking around with it outside. I haven't, say I just pull it out of the box and I've got it up on the roof and it's loose. It's not hooked up to anything. I can literally take those two cables and I can, I can do a spark weld with those. That DC voltage is uncontrollable. Here's an example. If there is an arc fault that occurs, not a ground fault, but an arc fault because the wiring was not done correct, what you now have is an unstoppable arc fault that is going to literally melt and create a molten lava that grows on your roof and eventually will burn through the entire system. And it will do that. Even if you shut the off switch off, it will do that because that panel does not have an off switch. And that panel you've coupled in series with the panel next to it. So it is essentially in a string series, it is gaining more and more voltage as it goes down the system. And any arc fault that occurs it will literally just continue to burn a hole and it will arc until the sun is down, until a tarp is over that system. We have a couple examples outside of Minnesota and California where installations occur on an hourly basis where um, you know, systems that haven't been installed right have had problems. So I've talked about uh, the implementation. We've talked about the solar resource on your site. We've talked about your electrical panel. We've talked about monitoring systems. Um, we've talked about rebates. What am, I, what am I missing? Permits. Permits. Permits are very important. Um, this is probably a question you get every day, but uh, I was thinking with how much the costs are going down with solar panels. You know, like I think I heard it's 30% cheaper than just a couple of years ago or something like that. Um, what I'm concerned with is buying, buying a system and then five years from now it's uh, 25% as expensive as now. So I'm trying to think when the ideal time would be to buy. <laughs> yes, so the, the question is specifically, what's the right time to buy? Is the technology I'm buying now, is it expensive? Is it efficient? What's it gonna be compared to two or three years down the road? I can tell you this. In our industry, we think of solar just like your cell phone or your laptop computer. It is always changing. The technology is always getting better. The technology is always changing. Maybe the phone you had two years ago didn't have a camera on it. Or maybe the phone yesterday you had, the new phone today, has a camera on the front and a camera on the back. You know, the phone you bought or the laptop you bought three years ago did what you needed it to do. 
It worked perfect. The solar system you put up, where you put it, whether you put it up three years ago or six years ago, is going to perform to the standards as installers and developers as we lay out. We can't stop the evolution of technology, but what we do know is that incentives, the credits and the rebates, will not be there forever. So you've got to justify and take that gamble. Do you, do you take the plunge now? I would say solar technology, um, I can't say it's at its apex. You know, most systems out there are pushing uh, efficiencies uh, anywhere from 17% on the high end. Maybe we're going to start to see some 19% efficiencies uh, in the actual solar PV modules. The solar thermal systems are running at approximately uh, anywhere from about 80% efficiency to 90% efficiency. The technology is always going to change. I don't have an answer for you on that, um, but think about it again. Our industry, it's like cell phones and laptop computers. It's changing every day. The prices continue to drop. Yes? With any year, I see you talk about this, the panels and stuff, but do you have any, any installations where they have batteries or something to store the energy? Great question. That actually leads me into NEC code, National Electrical Code. We just had some pretty big storms come through the cities here recently. Most people don't know that when the grid goes down, your solar system, if it's grid connected, is also going down. And if you're having a solar system installed, you are going to have it grid connected. So what's happened is, in North America, the NEC standard has said, any inverter, whether it's a microinverter or a centralized inverter, that does not see or read a power signal coming in from the grid will automatically shut down. And the reason for that is this. They do not want, as more and more of these systems are deployed and installed, the linemen that goes out to repair these lines, the servicemen that go out to work on these systems and storm damage, as we cannot have these systems backfeeding uncontrollable back into the grid. Because now we've energized, we've essentially energized the grid. And though it may not seem like it, we could have a down line that might be on the corner of the block over here, but not realize we have a warehouse that's two blocks away that's putting out 500,000 um, watts of energy and is dumping back into the grid. So there's a couple solutions for that. Um, battery backup systems are, are absolutely an, op an opportunity. They will almost double the cost of your installation. You've got a lot of infrastructure that needs to go into place. You've got charge controllers. You've got switch gear. You've got the batteries themselves. Uh, batteries are going to require maintenance. Uh, batteries have a life of about approximately maybe seven years to 10 years. So you're looking at a turnover in some of your batteries. Um, the other option, we've installed plenty of systems that have had uh, generator backup. So a gas-powered generator backup. Uh, that is an option. Answer your question? Yes. Okay. Um, I, uh, another question is, too, for the batteries that you use, mm -hmm. um, do you put the, the gel type? Uh, there's three different... Uh, types of batteries that can be used. There's a lead acid, there's a gel, and then there's the um, uh, uh, lithium uh, that are out there. Uh, typically, most battery backup systems are going to be kind of a lead acid, just a standard deep storage, a deep cycle battery. Yeah, yep. And they, they last, uh, the, the gel last longer than a deep cycle or a traditional deep cycle? You know, it really all depends the condition the batteries are in, how much they get used, how much they're depleted. And um, you, know, you might be able to stretch the gel maybe 10 years to 12 years. Um, I just think it's, you know, for some of the opportunities, the options that are out there, how often really does your power go down? Yes, we had a major storm that came through the metro. We're very lucky in Minnesota here. Our utility companies are, are very religious about clearing egress and access on our power lines. Out northeast and out east to the coast, their power goes down all the time. They have horrible, horrible maintenance and access along their power lines. So they've always got trees that are overgrowing. I mean, I've, I live in South Minneapolis here. I know when they come through every year, some of these trees look like a giant Y because they've got about six feet of clearance between the actual wire and the actual tree branches. I've got to say, uh, they actually do a pretty good job on clearing that. Uh, there is one other product that's out there. It's a new inverter that just came on the market that has a transfer switch in it and provides a portion of power back to the, back to the, um, the building or the house. 
It's not a very big load. I think it's about maybe 1200 watts, but it's enough to maybe keep your cell phone, your laptop, computer charge, and a couple of smaller devices. So that's, that's another option that's out there. Any other questions? Yes? Uh, batteries aside, the rest of the system, has it required much maintenance over the years? And uh, how do they hold up to storms, hail, and wind? Good question. Um, so, long-term maintenance, think about this. No moving parts on a solar renewable energy system. Unlike your furnace, unlike your boiler, unlike other mechanical equipment you have in your, have in your house, they all have mechanical moving parts. What's nice about solar energy is you put those panels up there, they will be up there the next 25 years. Uh, in terms of resistance to hail, to damage, storm damage, uh, all of our systems we installed, uh, this last storm that came through, we didn't have a single problem, we didn't have a single callback, didn't have a single issue. We actually had some systems that had pretty big branches land on them. Homeowners went up, cleared them away, not a problem. Uh, people ask about what about snow on these systems? How does the snow affect them? Uh, we tell most homeowners when we come through and do the solar site assessment, we do our calculations, we're already ruling out the loss that occurs through a snowfall event. We already calculate the loss that occurs through clouding. We deal with uh, specific data that's, that's been compiled over the last 10 years that forecasts an average amount of snowfall, an average amount of um, cloud shading that occurs. So the numbers we give you, and we really don't want our homeowners going up and trying to clear the snow off them, don't worry about it. It might be up there for a week or two or three weeks. The reality is it's going to clear. You're going to get the mo most of your production is going to clear occur during the summer months and those shoulder seasons. So um, the durability of them, uh, all of these modules on the market are tested with a steel bearing shot at 55 miles an hour. I believe it's a three quarter inch bearing shot at 55 miles an hour. It's a uh, tempered glass. Uh, you're going to see more damage that occurs to the aluminum frame than you will see it actually occurs to the glass. Uh, one incident that occurred, 10K Solar had a commercial system up in um, Golden Valley, North Minneapolis. I believe it was a Murphy warehouse. The tornado that went through, I think it was a year ago now, maybe two years now. Um, that system on that roof, that was a ballasted system. That means there was no roof penetrations. So this was a 40KW size array on the roof, not physically anchored to the roof. That system stayed in place while a tornado crossed the roof of the building, took the air handler, the mechanical equipment on the roof, took it up off its curb and moved it 50 feet. The array was ballasted with rock and that array stayed in place. Now the, what the tornado did do is it picked up quite a bit of aggregate on the roof. There's a lot of rock they put as ballast on the roof. Picked up some of that rock and it kind of shot it at the glass. So there were some issues there that had to be replaced. But that's covered under insurance. And the systems that you guys are going to install are also all covered under insurance. Answer your question? OK. Any, any other, one more question in the back? And then I just I want to talk real briefly, too. I want to cover community solar, which is one of the new big trends that's coming up. Yes? Talk about microinverters. Yes. Uh, so the question is about microinverters. Uh, there's two major different types of inverters you can have. We need to convert DC power on the roof to AC power so that you can use it. That occurs with a microinverter that is in the back of each module. Each module will have its own microinverter. It's going gonna, it's gonna to change DC to AC or you have what's called a string inverter. And your string inverter is a centralized inverter where we run a string line all the way through the solar PV system. We bring it down to a centralized inverter and it converts it at that point to AC power. Um, N-phase microinverters, the most common microinverter on the market. I think their market share is about probably 90% of the market. They have a great product, has a 25-year warranty on it. Think about that, a 25-year warranty on your microinverter and a 25-year warranty on your, your panel. How often do you get warranties like that? Complete replacement. That yes. Your sign? Yes. Yep. Okay, it's just not a... And then you're also, your, your uh, centralized inverters will have an average life anywhere from about 10 to 15 years. So the central inverters do typically have a life range of about 10 to 15 years. Something to think about, a centralized inverter might cost you about $3,000. Most manufacturers, you can get an extended warranty on that. 
so your warranty can be extended from 10 years to 20 years or longer. Um, the last part to wrap this up, you know, one of the neat components about the bill that's gone through at the Capitol, again, I talked a little bit about community solar. What's unique about community solar is this. It opens up a marketplace now to 70% of, to, to a marketplace that's been untapped that represents 70% of the market. So again, property owners, people that live in houses, condos, might not have a good roof, maybe they live in an apartment, people can now buy a subscription into a central community solar garden. So think about a community solar garden that you might find in a community where everyone can plant and everyone can reap benefits from it. A community solar garden is the same concept. And what we do is we worked with host sites, and a host site might be a warehouse, it might be a city building, it might be a state building, it might be a church. A facility with a large enough roof on it or enough property around it where we can put in a minimum 40 kW size array. What's nice for the host site is this. They get to participate in the benefits of having a community solar garden associated with them, but they don't have to spend any cost on it. Because the cost of a community solar garden is dispersed by the subscribers that are buying the share of energy and by investors that are coming in. What's nice about the host site is the fact that they will have a 25-year long-term lease. Whether it's on a roof or it's on a piece of land, that host site will have 25-year income generation just for hosting. So think about your church, possibly. Your church might be a great opportunity. It's got a big roof or it's got a roof that's either flat or it's, it's, it's facing south. A great opportunity where the church can participate. Now, the host site can also be a subscriber, up to 40% of that array. We talk about three components to community solar. A host site, an aggregator, and a subscriber. The subscribers would be all of us that might you know, purchase a subscription, a share of energy in that community solar array. An aggregator would be an organization that could be the host site itself, it could be the city, it could be a church, it could be a nonprofit organization such as MRES or maybe Sierra Club or any other organization that would be interested in bringing subscribers to a community solar array. Those aggregators have the potential to earn money. For example, City of Bloomington could be an aggregator. They could also be a host site. We understand that aggregators are going to organize and bring individuals to a community solar array, and there's a cost with that. It's resources, it's capacity of the city or the organization or anyone who's bringing subscribers in. And most typical community solar gardens, there's a commission for that. It's like a 10 cent per watt commission. Uh, for example, we are working with the city of Falcon Heights. They have a city park. Uh, large city park, part of it is, uh, is a non-tillable, non-used piece of land on that park. We have a 360 kW size array for that. The city can do a community solar garden at no cost to them. They can get a 25-year land lease that brings revenue back into the city. And the city wants to be the exclusive aggregator of the Falcon Heights Community Solar Garden. And an example of that, that city could then earn $36,000 in income generation just by bringing subscribers to the array. So it's a very unique model that for the first time in the state of Minnesota allows different levels of participation from different individuals. And it's a win-win for everybody because we're doing this with private dollars, we're using Minnesota-made products, and we're taking Minnesota dollars, and we're using them to invest in the system, and we're not pulling it back out to Wall Street, we're keeping it local, and we're developing truly economic development. So I'm going to end with that. A lot of exciting news that's occurred. And from my understanding, Tim, this is going to be up um, on the community's Bloomington's on the city website. On the city website. So uh, again, my name is Dustin Dennison uh, with Applied Energy Innovations and MN Community Solar, board member with MRES and Mencia. And I will put out some cards if anybody has some information uh, that they want to ask me later. Feel free to do that. Uh, otherwise, again, thank you for coming out. Brian, do you have any parting words? Yes, please. I would just like to thank Dustin very much for an excellent presentation.